turn it over to you. Thank you, Lacey, and uh, hi, everybody. Thanks a million for making some time to spend with us today. What I want to do is share with you a little bit of a smorgasbord of some things that we've been working on, uh, some of which will be uh, featured in more detail at this program in October that Lacey was just referring to, uh, the HR Emerging Executive and some of which uh, those of you on the call might be uh, familiar with through some of the work that John Boudreau and I and others, many others now, have been doing uh, around the future of HR. I'm going to touch on a few topics all connected in one way or another, uh, see if we can stimulate some questions and some dialogue for those of you who'd like to contribute, and I'll take a few pauses along the way to uh, to do just that. Uh, what I'd like to do first, uh, and Carrie, if you wouldn't mind advancing uh, to the first slide on the future of HR, uh, those of you who've been involved with the center for a while and have um, interacted with John and me in the past know that uh, a few years ago we started the process of working on a project related to future of HR, particularly in the context of how do we as HR leaders remain relevant in a world where everything is changing so rapidly and in some cases so completely? Uh, the world of work itself, but also the workforce and the workplace. And we began to ask ourselves the question, what are some trends and themes that we're starting to see emerge? I'm going to touch briefly on a few of those just to provide a little bit of history and context, especially for those of you who may not be as familiar with some of the things we've done in the past, and then we'll build on that. Uh, we began a few years ago looking at this question around the context of half a dozen or so themes that we thought were going to be uh, increasingly relevant in the world of work and therefore in the world of HR, we began to identify some things such as uh, the move more toward collective leadership and, and companies beginning to invest in the, a broader set of capabilities that would be more consistent uh, among leaders. Uh, what do we expect from those leaders uh, in our particular company, in our particular culture? We also began to see uh, an emergence of what we called Agile Co-Creativity, which is people who historically had been responsible for innovation in companies like research and development types in pharmaceutical firms or creatives in advertising firms, uh, no longer having exclusive purview to the creative process and that innovation increasingly is becoming uh, a game that's played by many people inside of a company, but enabled by social media, uh, many people outside the walls of our own companies. They might be customers, they might be consumers, they might be suppliers, they might be simply fans of our product or service who are all contributing to the co-creation process. We also began to look at a number of different marketing-related principles and how they might apply to doing HR work. Things like personal value proposition, segmentation came out of that in the, the earlier days of our work a few years ago. Essentially what we were finding is that uh, even though many companies are investing a lot of time and money in creating a more compelling value proposition, why the typical employee might want to come to work for us and might choose to stay with us after they join our company. Uh, what's also beginning to happen because of a tight talent market uh, and certain pivotal skills that are uh, just not easily accessible for a lot of our companies, finding the need to more uh, directly appeal to specific individuals and certain pivotal roles and treat them differently than we tend to treat everybody else, which quite frankly, continues to be an area that makes a lot of HR people nervous or uncomfortable because of the history we have in our profession about wanting to treat people fairly. And of course, there's nothing unfashionable about treating people fairly that's 
critically important. But what we're also finding is fairness is, is not necessarily equated or should not be equated with sameness and treating everybody the same, uh, especially in an environment where we have scarce resources and limited ability to invest selectively and strategically in our best talent. Uh, another theme that emerged a few years ago was around this issue of sustainability and uh, focusing really on two dimensions of sustainability. One is uh, organizations that have completely fatigued, wiped out, exhausted employees find it very difficult to sustain performance over time. Uh, and then uh, the second definition, which is separate but related, is around environmental sustainability and the contribution that our companies are making to uh, building and preserving a, a safer, more secure, environmentally secure planet. And what's HR's role in that? Uh, and a bit of a disconnect, which we'll come back to in a few minutes, about the fact that uh, environmental sustainability was becoming an increasingly noted area of emphasis for companies, but that quite frankly, HR people are often absent from that effort. Uh, and then the final theme that emerged a few years ago, which we started to really focus on, was the uh, move toward um, education through analytics. In other words, being able to paint a compelling picture, tell a story through data and analytics in ways that went well beyond the typical persuasion skills that most HR people tend to have where we attempt to persuade people to our way of thinking based on relationships and trust and our own credibility and the passion that we have for the topic. Those things are all extremely important, will always be, but generally we're finding they're not sufficient for uh, selling people uh, to our point of view, particularly in an environment of scarce resources. Uh, and then uh, a couple of years later, uh, we began to get a deeper focus on some additional areas of emphasis for the, the future of HR. And Carrie, if you would advance the slide for me, uh, one slide. We began to get a lot of input from many companies who had an interest in this uh, evolution, if you will, of HR and HR's role, who asked us to look a little bit more deeply at some things that they were wrestling with in their own organizations and uh, things like big data and gamification, generational diversity, and all the other things that you see on this slide began to come to the surface with regard to what they were wrestling with. And um, what we learned from going through this process was a couple of interesting things that really have uh, influenced our thinking over the course of the more recent past, over the last year and a half or so. And what I want to do is uh, tell you what, I, what we learned and then tell you what we're now starting to do about it. So I'm going to advance the slide or ask Terry to advance the slide one more where uh, some of you have heard me talk about this before. What we did was we, we uh, began to survey uh, about 300 uh, HR leaders from 11 different companies who were part of a consortium that we were uh, involved in. Uh, many different industries represented, many different companies, all with one singular common interest, which was the future of HR, and began asking some questions of them around uh, all of these nine different areas, ranging from globalization on the far left to gamification on the far right, on a couple of different dimensions. Uh, you know, fundamentally, what we were asking them was, how real and relevant are these things for you in your daily job today versus to what degree you think they'll become more relevant in the future, meaning the next three to five years or so, and uh, what role are you playing today in involving yourself in these areas versus uh, what role do you think you'll be expected to play in the future and therefore how expert and knowledgeable do you need to become about it? And uh, boiling down a lot of data and a lot of analysis to one slide, what I want to do is draw your attention to the bars, the dark colored bars and the light colored bars. And what you might notice is that in terms of the dark colored bars, 
uh, there were certain areas that most people in HR were telling us were real, were relevant. Essentially, they've arrived. People are dealing with them on a pretty regular basis each day. Examples of that would be globalization as their companies continue to globalize, generational diversity because they're seeing uh, four, some people would say even five different generations in the workforce at the same time. Uh, and those would be a couple of examples, among others, of things that were very real and relevant. There were other things to the far right, such as gamification and big data, just to pick a couple of examples, where people were saying, you know, at least in today's environment, uh, I'm not, I hear about it, I've read a few things about gamification and, and the, the application of game-related principles to HR practices. I hear a lot of people talking about big data but it's not something that's dramatically influencing my life as an HR person today. Yet when we ask them the question about uh, the future, what role should HR play uh, in the future in each of these nine things, it really caught our attention, as you can see with the lighter colored bars, that almost irrespective of the topic and irrespective of how real or relevant it was to them in that moment, uh, people were saying essentially that they really feel like they need to be knowledgeable about, expert in, and actively involved in essentially all of them. And the conclusion that we came to was, uh, you know, our, our reach may really be exceeding our grasp. It's not really possible, even if it were desirable, and I'm not sure it is desirable, for us as HR leaders to be equally expert in all of these things in a short period of time, fast enough to be relevant and make a contribution. And therefore, there are some implications about the need to reach out beyond the traditional boundaries of HR to bring together capability and expertise from other disciplines and other areas of expertise beyond HR to solve some of these complex problems that are implied by these emerging themes. And what I want to do now as a result of that as a backdrop is tell you about some things we've been doing a bit more recently with regard to uh, future of HR work and some implications it has for the evolving role of HR leaders. Carrie, if you take us to the next slide around the future of HR project overview and context, what I want to do is give those of you who may not be as familiar a bit of uh, additional history here. So about a year and a half ago, uh, we began to discover, not surprisingly, that there were a lot of other people uh, in the HR profession who were wrestling with many of these other issues, some of which uh, were very good colleagues and friends of ours, and we began to band together uh, a bit of a consortium around the uh, future of HR project, as we called it, that um, had as its purpose addressing a few things, which are represented graphically in this chart, and I'm going to touch briefly on a couple of them. And that is that HR, we were feeling as a group, is, is becoming at a critical inflection point, you know, where it, it either is going to grow and change and be capable as a profession of addressing a lot of these emerging themes, or we'll find ourselves increasingly irrelevant and organizations will look for other solutions outside of HR as a function to deliver those um, solutions. We also had quite a few conversations with people who um, used terminology such as HR people are really good at building individual campfires and focusing on issues as they see them to be important. What we've not been as good at as a profession is building a more collective bonfire to address these needs more broadly. Uh, and finally, the point that really began to hit home for a number of us was the pipeline and the implications for the talent pipeline within HR and where the next generation of HR leaders would come from and what they really need to be good at in order to make a contribution in different ways in the future was really starting to worry us. So we built a um, group of about 30 or so CHROs 
uh, great thinkers, people who've had great track records and um, well-known uh, and respected in the field, brought them together to help us begin to think through this process. And uh, we ended up focusing, as you might imagine, after looking at literally dozens and dozens of things that we might pay attention to, four primary areas of emphasis that we've begun to uh, place our attention on. And Carrie, if you would advance the slide for me to the next one, what I want to do is take you through four uh, areas briefly of what our attention has been focusing on over the last year or so, and then tell you a little bit about some things we're learning related to that. Essentially, what we've experienced is the need to zero in on a few things, less than a handful of things that we could begin to get our arms around, one of which has to do with aligning HR's contribution to value creation and helping organizations win. So at its most basic level, when you think about business strategy, business strategy is fundamentally about winning and creating a winning approach compared to competitors, what's HR's role in that? What can we contribute as a profession? And the realization is perhaps we've not been as contributing as fully as we could and should. So that became one work stream. A uh, second work stream had to do with our interaction with HR's key constituents and the expectations that those key constituents have and ultimately should have of the profession. And first and foremost, we we chose to focus primarily on CEOs and board members. And I'm going to come back in a minute and tell you a bit about what we learned from some of those conversations. A third area that we identified was what we called rewiring the work of HR. This became fundamentally a question about the systems the processes, the practices, the operating model with which HR delivers its work. And we actually ended up concluding for a variety of reasons, this was a work stream that probably required uh, a bit of a delay pending the outcome of the other three work streams. So we haven't done quite as much on that. And then the final work stream, which has turned out to be quite central to what we're doing, is this HR talent pipeline that I was mentioning a few minutes ago. And uh, it's actually expanded in many ways beyond the core of HR to say, what is the talent pipeline that we need to draw from with what set of capabilities going forward, irrespective of whether those capabilities sit within HR or somewhere outside of HR. And as part of this process, a couple of things that you might want to know if you're not familiar with it already, uh, the project as it became, uh, or as it got off the ground, became uh, very much guided by the principle of open source so that any of the work that we were going to do is going to be a highly collaborative effort with input from a variety of different sources, all for the benefit of the advancement of the profession, not proprietary to any one single individual or organization, and began to be sponsored by um, some funders, such as SHRM, the National Academy of HR, uh, ultimately in our second phase uh, consulting firm, PwC, uh, a new organization called um, IRC for HR, some of you may be familiar with, joined also toward the end of our second phase. And we're actually now in the process of working with uh, additional potential sponsors to help fund our third phase, which I'll come back and talk some more about in just a moment. Uh, what I want to do next is to tell you a little bit about some of the areas that we've been focusing on within each of these work streams but before I do that, I'm going to take a pause here for a moment, see if there are any questions or comments that have been generated by what I've said first. And I'm going to ask Carrie to let me know if there are any folks who've raised a question in the question box before I proceed. 
Yeah, Ian, we have um, one question from Nancy. She asked, during the research for Future of HR, did you engage other functions on how they view HR? Yeah, great question, Nancy. Thank you. Uh, yes, a little, not as much as we wanted to in the initial phase. So we ended up talking to some operating leaders and a few CEOs here and there about what we were doing to get the benefit of their perspective. I think we've done a, a little bit better job of that, frankly, in this last phase that we've just completed, particularly as it relates to the uh, constituents and their expectations of HR, where we talked to um, quite a few more CEOs and board members, and I'll share with you and everyone else in a moment uh, some of the things we learned from that conversation. Carrie, are there any other questions that have emerged so far? That's the only question so far. All right, great. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and proceed on for a few more minutes, and then I'll take another pause to see if anything else has come to mind in terms of questions. If you take us over to the next chart, Kerry, what I want to do is talk about uh, one of the work streams that I mentioned earlier was focusing on um, HR's role in, in helping organizations win and create value. And, of course, one of the things that – the team that was working on this with us did a great job of was coming to the realization that you need to understand the external environmental context that you're operating in before you can figure out um, what HR's contribution is going to be to helping the organization win. And uh, I want to touch briefly, uh, just very briefly, on these five forces of change that, uh, that our team uh, helped us zero in on, as you might imagine, starting literally with um, dozens and dozens of potential themes and trends that characterize the external environment that we're in. Uh, let me just tell you about five of them now to give you a flavor for what we uh, began to focus on. One being uh, the exponential nature of technological change. And one analogy I like to use is the computer industry. If you think about over the years, the shift from the mainframe to the desktop to the laptop to the handheld to now we're getting into an environment where computerized devices are either injectable into the human body or uh, ingestible to the human body where you actually um, yeah, eat them, so to speak. Uh, and all of the data that's being generated now in an in a unbelievably powerful way with microscopic um, tools and technology behind it and how quickly that's happened over the years. And this is just an analogy. The computer uh, industry is just an analogy for so many industries uh, that are going through that type of exponential transformational change. One factoid about this that I particularly have liked is that the Internet is often credited for creating 2.6 jobs for every job that it has destroyed. Uh, but the problem is there's a complete disconnect between uh, the jobs that are being created as a result of the Internet and the capability and skill base that a lot of the available talent uh, has to offer. And this is creating a complete transformation uh, of the workforce. Uh, building on that theme, one of the second forces of change of the five is around social and organizational reconfiguration, which is all about the changing demographics of the workforce, the aging of the workforce, the transformation of where and when and how and with whom work gets done. Uh, it's also about the, the question that you might have to ask yourself, what happens when the traditional employment model, as we know it, pretends, begins to erode and give way to shorter-term, more bite-sized, project-based, freelance kinds of gigs, what implications might that have for a lot of the traditional HR practices and processes, policies, and the role that HR people play? A third force of change that our team focused a lot on was this notion of the truly connected world where everything is becoming mobile 24-7, virtual, global, uh, and what implications does that have for the way HR work gets done? A fourth one was around the talent market 
particularly the fact that we're dealing with an increasingly boundaryless market, not only geographically, but reaching out beyond the boundaries of traditional functional disciplines for people who have a broader set of capabilities and a more integrated way of thinking about solving these large complex problems and orchestrating solutions. And then the final uh, of the five forces of change that really makes your head hurt when you think about it is human and machine collaboration, or some people would say human and machine conflict as computers and other machines begin to take on roles that were traditionally reserved for human beings, you know, whether or not you think about, you know, the ATM versus the bank teller as one you know, early example of this, all the way to uh, Uber, which is its own controversy today uh, as a supplier of ground-based transportation, where um, the driver of an Uber vehicle is essentially being given all of their instruction about where to go and when to get there by a computer. And so we're ending up in a scenario now where um, we're moving increasingly from collaboration with machine to machine-led, and what implications does that have for the workforce? If we move on to the next chart, what this team that's been focusing on HR's role in value creation and helping organizations win begins to raise some pretty significant implications for uh, new sorts of roles that HR people might take on. And here's the, here's the logic trail maybe uh, that goes along with that. If you, if you believe that any of the five forces of change, perhaps not all of them, but some subset of them, would be relevant for your company and the industry that you're in, and you begin to think about what the impact of those things are on your business and the changing nature of work itself, and then what happens to the workforce and what happens to organizations or the workplace, then there are some implications for the future of HR in terms of the kind of work we do. I wanna to just touch on a few of those to get your, uh, your, your lens stimulated a little bit, much the way our team had to focus on this. You know, so one potential role is, is really one that they ended up describing as the organizational engineer, which is the person who's most knowledgeable about and responsible for organizational capability, bringing teams of people together to solve these complex problems uh, and doing it in rapid fashion, you know, much faster than what we traditionally have allowed ourselves to do through more traditional HR practices. The culture architect is really the person who increasingly has got the job of reconciling not only the organizational culture and what we need and expect of people within that culture, but also the increasingly important element of purpose, which seems to be growing in its importance particularly for the new entrants to the workforce and the millennial generation wanting to be working for a place where the purpose of the business aligns with their own personal value system and their own sense of purpose. The scout, convener, coach related to the talent space is somebody who's got, of course, some of the traditional responsibilities of finding and bringing talent into our company, but having to do that now in an environment where the traditional employment model may no longer apply, bringing people together for these shorter term gigs to solve a specific issue or problem with full expectation that they're not going to be there long term, uh, and what does that mean for their own coaching and development uh, and how to find and keep and then let go of those people, a totally new way of thinking about bringing talent in uh, and utilizing them well. The, the integrator of data and talent and technology has got this difficult job of big data, the analytics behind the big data, and 
then trying to make sense of what all that data actually means and what do I do with it in a practical way uh, in my organization in ways that are significantly more practical and simple than what most companies are wrestling with today. And then finally, the social policy and community activist actually has uh, a, a set of implications that I personally am finding quite important over the last couple of years because HR people, generally speaking, in my experience, don't do a particularly great job of playing a role external to their own organizations, having a perspective on what's going on in the world around us not only with our competitors in our own industry, but other industries, uh, influencing public policy, the whole corporate social responsibility uh, element to things. Most HR people, I think, have tended to excel where they have excelled because they're uh, internally focused, highly trusted, help organizations down and in be more effective, and that's all extremely important and not to be devalued but increasingly the implications are, as we see them, uh, being more of an activist in a positive way, uh, externally uh, advancing the cause of the organization and, in fact, understanding what the implications are because you know what's happening in the world around you. To that point, what I want to do is advance uh, one more slide, and then we'll take another break to see if there's any questions. I mentioned earlier that uh, one of our teams was focusing on the work stream of understanding and hopefully raising the bar on expectations of key constituents outside of HR. And what this team uh, began to focus on, the work is certainly not done yet, began to focus on was talking to uh, CEOs and board members in particular about a few things. You know, what, what is HR doing today in, in the organizations where you're interacting with them, what should they be doing, and uh, how are they doing? You know, how, how well is it actually being done? And um, as you can imagine, a lot of conversations, a lot of interviews, a lot of questions and dialogue back and forth, this chart is intended to uh, be a little bit of a summary of some of the output from those conversations. And frankly, it's a bit sobering, which is why I wanted to share it with you, because it got our attention, and hopefully it'll get your attention. If you look at the list of things that are shared here from analytics and experimentation all the way through um, leadership architecting, these are the types of things that you would say a CEO or a board member might reasonably expect uh, of a highly effective HR leader. You know, C CHRO, of course, but also the people who who are working with and for the CHRO and HR. And what most of the feedback would tend to suggest is, you know, I have worked with HR leaders in the past, and even currently, of course, who do a number of these things well. However, when I look collectively across HR as a profession, I don't think the profession, on balance, does most of these things well, with a few exceptions around, uh, you know, great consultation skills and being a good partner to various business leaders, dealing with um, the day-to-day -day workforce management kinds of issues. Those are all things where I think most HR people collectively and consistently are pretty good. These other areas around, you know, using analytics to make uh, business decisions and experimentation and trying new things uh, is not an area where we think HR people are as good as they need to be. Same is true with overall business acumen and, and many of the other things that are listed on this page that I won't go into in, in great depth. So a couple of takeaways from this, if you're wondering, you know, what does this all mean to me? I'd be thinking about it in the context of a few things. First of all, um, making sure that you have a good understanding of what your CEO and the senior leadership team of your company are looking for from you or from the HR organization more broadly, and how well are you doing against those things. 
Secondly, understanding what the board of directors, to the extent that your company has a board of directors, is paying attention to around the HR dimension because increasingly it's going well beyond uh, executive compensation and succession planning and extending now increasingly into other areas of talent and culture uh, and analytics and a variety of other areas. Uh, and then the final thing that I would say is don't be disheartened by the fact that you see a bunch of X's here because what it represents is an opportunity to reshape our own capability uh, in alignment with the growing and changing expectations of operating leaders and board members outside of HR because, quite frankly, you might argue that 20 years ago, n many of the things that are on this list would not even have been expectations of HR. People would have expected less, and they would have been receiving less, uh, and now they're expecting more, and they're waiting for us as a profession to catch up, which is, frankly, for me, one of the most exciting aspects of being involved in this work. And you think about the evolution of HR leadership is, first of all, setting the tone for what we should be contributing, and secondly, then uh, helping people close the gap. Let me stop there for a moment and see if what I've talked about these last few minutes has stimulated any questions or comments before we continue on. Carrie, any questions in the question box? Yeah, so Nancy has um, submitted two more questions. The first one you've sort of addressed, so I'll just ask them both at the same time. Um, so first it's what skills and competencies will the future HR professional need, for example, the activist or the integrator? And the second question is do you envision an HR function comprised of cross-disciplinary backgrounds, for example, IT or marketing? Yeah, yeah, so and I think they are very much related. So if we take the, um, and, and again, of course, what I'm giving you today is a, is a sampling of many of the things that we're beginning to discover are important elements of what HR people need to be good at. A few things that I would emphasize or reemphasize for um, additional thought uh, one in particular is this notion of orchestration, the ability, whether you call it being an organizational engineer or a convener or an orchestra conductor, which I'll come back and talk about in a minute, the ability to bring to the party a broad enough perspective on the business internally and externally to understand what the drivers are for business success, how to make the organization win, and then having the capability to identify the skill set and the people that are required to solve the problem. And to your second question, Nancy, oftentimes the skill set or the background or experience that's required to solve the problem does not reside in HR. And I think the traditional way of HR people trying to address that would be to say, well, you know, we've got to train or develop uh, all of our HR people to get better at analytics or to get better at big data or to get better at social media or to get better at gamification or to get better at mass customization kinds of concepts. And the reality is that even though we might like our HR people to get better at those things, and they're certainly capable of learning those things over time, <clears throat> organizational need is, is too short-term, too fast, changing too rapidly for us to keep pace. Therefore, to your second question, I definitely envision a scenario where HR's job is to bring to bear the capability from other functions to solve these large, complex, multidimensional, multidisciplinary kinds of problems. In some cases, that'll end up meaning that finance people or marketing people or um, statisticians or economists or other disciplines get hired and brought into HR. Some companies today are building fairly substantial uh, analytics functions, for example, that are being populated with people who know statistics, who know economics, who know finance, who know marketing. They might be um, from almost any discipline, and they're being brought into HR. But I would also say equally likely 
is that uh, these become partnerships where you bring people in to help solve a problem. They don't necessarily come work in HR full time or long term because the CEO, frankly, doesn't really care where the solution comes from. They really only care about that it gets delivered. And HR, inc increasingly, in my opinion, has the role or will have the role of bringing those capabilities together because there's really no other function, frankly, that has the boundary spanning capability and perspective that HR people do and should. We just have to do more of it and we have to do it much faster than we've historically done it. That would be my take. Other questions or comments? That's the only question right now. All right, so I'm going to continue to build on the story then, and um, we'll take some time right at the end to see if there are any additional or final questions. But one of the implications of all of this that I've been thinking about lately uh, is around the future of leadership development. So, Carrie, if you would advance the slide for me, what I want to do is talk for a few minutes about some thinking I've been doing on this and see if it resonates with uh, what you're living with. You know, one conclusion I've been coming to, of course, is that nothing really happens without great leadership, and therefore all of these implications for these trends, the changing nature of work or the workforce or the workplace, the work environment, <clears throat> the business environment that we're in, the demographics that we're dealing with that are really unchangeable at this point, have some fairly substantial implications for the way that we think about developing leaders because even if HR's role is to be a little bit more involved in and a bit more effective at addressing some of these things, we can't do it by ourselves. And much of the work that we do in HR, as you all know better than I do, uh, ends up being delivered with and through our peers who are running businesses and leading people. And so I've been trying to think about what does this all mean for developing a lot of these leaders. And what I want to do is take you through uh, about 10 thoughts that I have on this. I'm going to touch on a few briefly and a few a bit more in depth. And uh, Carrie, if you flip us over to the next slide, I'll take a crack at the first five of these and then I'll uh, finish up with the, the final five. Uh, but one thing that seems to be coming pretty quickly is this concept of, you know, chief organizational capability officer. And you might argue that that's a role that HR people play, and it's probably true, but it's also something that I think is, is more characterization. It's more, it's more of a characterization of what leaders need to be good at in the future. And here's what I mean by that. A big part of the leader's job in the future, to me, is all about integrating and driving capabilities like agility and a better understanding of business context and the environment in which we do business. It's about, you know, helping to deal with change and culture and innovation and a more networked kind of organization that's not so hierarchical uh, as what we've been dealing with in the past plus all the talent issues that we've been discussing and broader transformation, that's a fairly long list of things. And I think the point is not so much that it's a long list, is more that, the, that in order to do this effectively, it's really about connecting the dots between all of these things and developing leaders who know how to uh, turbocharge, if you will, these in-between points not so much about mastering the hierarchy or becoming uh, really astute at the formal organization. That's where developing leaders needs to go, is, is making people more comfortable at and better at these kinds of things. A second theme that's very connected to some of the things we've been talking about up to this point is about outside in being more important than inside out. And what I mean by that is environmental context on the outside, the external point of view is going to increasingly be the leadership currency of choice. That will distinguish the very best leaders from everybody else. 
Whereas in the past, I think a lot of leaders who were viewed as great leaders were viewed that way because they really mastered the internal culture of our organization. They know how things get done. They know who everybody is in the organization. They have high credibility. They're trusted. And those things are still important. But uh, what I think is becoming increasingly important is that they also have an understanding of what's going on in the world around them and being able to see around corners, therefore, better because they understand what's coming at them from the outside. And leadership development work is going to have to help people become better at that. Uh, third one is around this notion of hero leadership giving way to collective leadership. And I talked about that a little bit earlier in our call, so I won't dwell on that other than to say organizations have got to be ready to teach leaders, develop leaders, hold them accountable for the kinds of behavior attributes that are expected of leaders in our particular company's culture rather than over relying on singular, iconic, highly visible hero-like leaders who may or may not represent the organization well, but there aren't enough of them to go around, even if they do. And so investing in a broader, uh, more collective set of leadership capability is clearly coming and becoming of increasing importance. We've already talked a lot about the increasingly multidisciplinary, cross-functional nature of things. And most of the big issues that companies are facing today are by definition large, they're complex, they're multidisciplinary, they're cross-functional in nature, and as a result, in order to solve them, uh, leaders have to be good at reaching outside and beyond the traditional boundaries of their own areas of expertise, their own function. That's true of HR, which is why we're talking about it as part of the future uh, of HR project that I've been describing. But it's also equally true uh, of all kinds of other operating leaders because, as I said earlier, CEOs and other senior executives don't really care where these solutions come from. All they want is the solution and being able to teach leaders through our leadership development efforts to think about solving these problems in multidisciplinary and cross-functional ways, I believe is going to be essential. And one of the corollaries to this, uh, the final uh, point on this particular slide, is around collaboration across boundaries having this multiplier effect. What I mean by that is that in order to develop leaders effectively, I think we're going to increasingly find companies looking for development opportunities that allow them to move leaders outside of their own company for a specific period of time on a developmental assignment that might not be available within their own company. So it requires a much higher degree of collaboration between companies to be able to say, uh, you know, we need to develop some global leaders. You're much more global than we are. How can we send one of our best and brightest to you to give them some experience in globalization? Uh, another company might say, you know, we need to develop much more capability in supply chain management, which has not historically been one of our strengths. Um, how can we uh, take one of our leaders and embed them in your environment for a little bit because that's an area of expertise? This requires a much higher degree of comfort with getting outside the arbitrary boundaries of specific companies or specific industries or specific roles. So uh, those are a few examples. And then uh, if we move over to the next chart, I'm just going to touch uh, briefly on a couple of them here because we've covered a few of these concepts already uh, in, in our call. But one of the things that I'm learning from my own coaching practice is that Coaching is increasingly becoming an accepted and more popular tool for developing leaders. And, you know, years past, coaching used to be equated with uh, taking a leader who was somewhat broken and trying to fix them before they crashed and burned. Uh, increasingly, that's the, that's the least common scenario that I find myself in today. Most of the time I'm spending with leaders is, is working with people who are highly regarded, already successful, and what you're trying to do is 
build on their strengths and help them prepare for bigger jobs. The analogy I like to think of is the athlete or the musician who's generally practicing to prepare for a game or a performance. Part of that practice is dealing with situations before they actually have to face them, you know, whether it's in in an athletic endeavor, or whether it's in playing a piece of music, preparing to deal with it uh, in practice before you actually have to face them in a performance or a game time situation, which is really all about developing uh, muscle memory. And I think the analogy for leadership development is developing leadership muscle memory to help people be comfortable in dealing with these issues before they actually have to deal with them. The last point I want to make is actually item number um, 10, because we've covered some of the others uh, a bit already, where most of us in dealing with succession planning, we tend to focus a lot on developing leaders who are ready now, you know, ready now to step into the next job, whatever that next job may be. And that's, to me, a, a very legitimate uh, pursuit, but it's getting more and more difficult to actually do it with credibility because all of the things we've been talking about uh, seem to suggest that the the past isn't really how the future is going to be, right? So a lot of people, when you think about developing leaders and succession planning, we would say past track record is the best predictor of future success. Increasingly, I guess I would say that past track record may only be a valid predictor of future success if the past looks anything like the future. And uh, what I think we're increasingly finding is that the future doesn't look a whole lot like the past at all. So being able to develop leaders who have situational awareness and flexibility and savvy and the understanding of how to quickly adapt to changing conditions, that's a way of developing ready, able leaders, people who are able to deal with whatever is being thrown at them in the moment as opposed to ready now, because ready now tends to suggest you have a pretty good understanding of what they're going to be facing, and the reality is that we often do not. So um, I'll stop there in terms of leadership development piece, and um, we'll move on to the next chart, because I just want to reemphasize one thing before I open it back up to questions. Much of what we've been talking about today, much of what you would hear uh, in the uh, three program that we're going to be doing in October, much of what you would see in the future of HR project work that we've been focusing on and will continue to focus on really has to do with this notion of HR as orchestra conductor, being able to, uh, rather than be an expert at playing the flute and the violin and the timpani and the clarinet playing the role more of the conductor whose job it is to find the very best musicians in the world, bring them together, uh, play beautiful music, and um, deliver an outstanding experience to the audience uh, on that basis rather than from their own personal expertise in every instrument. And increasingly, I think HR people are going to be asked to do the, uh, the same with that. The final point I'd make before we see if there are any last questions, if we just go to the last slide, Terry, uh, Lacey mentioned uh, at the beginning in the introduction um, that um, I've got a book coming out in the early part of September called Three, The Human Resources Emerging Executive. So if anything that we've talked about today has stimulated your interest and the desire to learn a little bit more and get a bit more deeply into the topic, you would find a number of the things we've covered will also be uh, addressed more in depth in three. And um, I'm happy to entertain uh, any conversations with any of you you might have offline about uh, the book or anything you might like to learn about that. For today, let me stop here and see if there are any final thoughts or questions before we wrap up the call. I don't have any questions in the chat box, but we can give it a minute in case anyone wants to talk. Oh. We had one just come in. So um, Lynn is asking, how could one get involved in the work streams you described up front? Oh, yeah. Thank you, Lynn. If you, if you would like, 
uh, and any this is true for any of you, um, you can just feel free to email me, iziskin at exexgroup.com, and let me know of your interest. We're actually in the process now as we're building out phase three of having a number of conversations with potential volunteers to work on the work streams as well as potential uh, financial sponsors for the work that we're doing. We'd be happy to um, talk with you about that, get you connected with the right folks on the team, and see if there's a good fit on one of the work streams. So thanks for the question and the offer. Any other questions? Well, if there are no other questions, Ian and Carrie, that was perfect timing. It is exactly 10 o'clock. <laughs> so last call for questions. Carrie, anything on your end? I don't have anything. Okay, perfect. Well, uh, thank you so much for everyone who has joined us on today's call. And Ian, thank you so much for leading us through this topic. We look forward to hearing what's next and really appreciate your insight. Um, so thank you so much and have a great afternoon. Great. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate you being with us.